welcome to another edition of New England Authors. It's so good to have you. We're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We broadcast on stations throughout the area. Thank you to the Curiosity Foundation. And we have um, a wonderful guest today, Dr. Arthur Kleinman. Welcome to the show, Dr. Thank Kleinman. Uh, Dr. Kleinman is a distinguished psychiatrist and medical anthropologist at Harvard, known for his cu cross-cultural work, especially with mental illness in uh, China and East Asia. And he was uh, known there as Dr. Kai, known affectionately as Dr. Kai. At Harvard, Dr. Kleinman has supervised more than 100 PhD students and more than 200 post-grad uh, fellows. He has taught hundreds of medical uh, students in, in the Harvard Medical School and undergraduate school students. And so, Dr. Kleinman, you're a wonderful credit to the community. I'm really happy to have you. you here. Thank you. And uh, so my, I got these books that are sitting right next to me from my wife's bookshelf. She is an avid reader of yours. And I just want to show some of the books uh, that you have out. I, I'm sure you have a lot more than this, don't you? Yes. Yeah, OK. So first of all, we have um, Patients and Healers in the uh, Context of Culture. Then we have Writing at the Margin. And then we have The Illness Narrative, Suffering, Healing, and the Human Condition. And rethinking psychiatry from culture category from uh, cultural category to personal experience, and then we have uh, culture and depression. So we get the feeling of of both anthropology and medicine here. Yeah. But then you came out with a very different book. Yes. Called, I, yeah. Yeah. I've just uh, brought out from Penguin, Viking: The Soul of Care, which is, in a way, a summation of the things that I've tried to do in the course of my life, but. Uh, it was um, initiated, as it were, by the 10 years that I took care of my late wife, Joan, yeah. as she succumbed to Alzheimer's disease, right. early onset Alzheimer's. And, um, and hence, the book is almost, you can almost think of it as a caduceus, you know, a staff with a snake uh, uh, wrapped around it. Uh -huh. The central staff is about caregiving and the caregiving crisis in our country, in families and in the profession. And this woven around it is the story of our lives, Joan and myself, uh, first uh, 36 years when she took care of me, uh, and then the last 10 years when I was her caregiver. Yes. She had early on onset Alzheimer's. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the book is very, uh, there's a lot of emotion in that book. There's a lot of feeling yes. in there. You were, you were very close. You, for many years, you traveled together, you worked together, yes. uh, and so on. And then, um, you know, if I was to go out and ask a psychiatrist anywhere in the United States, do you know Arthur Klein? Oh, yes, I've known his work, and so on. And yet, when you're faced with this situation, yeah. there was this helplessness. Yeah, yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think I felt overwhelmed at the onset. First of all, at that stage of my life, I was not woke or liberated, and my wife and I had had a traditional marriage. I had gone out to work, and she had done some research with me. She was a fine China scholar, but she took care of everything having to do with the home. Yeah. I took on all those activities at the onset of our caregiving. I wasn't sure I'd be good at them. I don't know how good I was, but I was able to do them, which, yeah. uh, which I think astonished my wife at the beginning yeah. and surprised me. But over time, uh, uh, as I took care of her, it went from the sort of light humor we just shared of, um, hey, this guy can really do things like clean the house and wash the dishes and cook the meals, to the sadness of having to uh, feed her, bathe her, uh, ambulate to her, um, hold her in such a way that she wouldn't fall. Yes. Uh, all these things are, when they're done with adults, you know, there's an old Yiddish saying, when a parent helps a child, both laugh. But when a child helps a parent, both cry. Wow. That's, yes. This was uh, a spouse helping another spouse, but in such a way of so basic a sense of needs that it was very sad. And yeah. But the book is written, is the kind of book I would have liked to have read when I started this. I would like to have known, well, what's ahead for me? What, what, what should I get ready for? And the like. And it, 
looks at the fact that really at the outset of this problem, even though I've been at Harvard Medical School for four decades, and uh, many of the doctors there knew me well and wanted to do everything they could to help me, yeah. the specialists in particular had nothing to offer after making the diagnosis. Now that was important. Making yeah. the diagnosis was critically important. But then it stopped there. And virtually no one told me about get ready f when you'll need a home health aid. You're going to need to change the way the house is organized. You're going to have to think at some stage of assisted living or nursing homes. All of that was left out of the conversation. That was, the, that was one thing. The second thing was that we were, as you pointed out, uh, influenced by Chinese culture. Yes. But we were a little bit of a surprise to the doctors and nurses because... You spent a lot of time in China. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. were a team. And that's very much, in the, we absorbed, as it were, the Chinese emphasis on family. And we were a team. We did things together. We, we were not so individualized, as it were. Yeah. And um, the focus of the American medical system is so much on the sick individual, but so poorly engages the family caregivers. And so for us, we wanted to improve this by showing that we were together. We did these things together. But in spite of that, we ran into very, very substantial problems. And these problems tell us a lot about where care in our society is today. Yeah. And, that, and I would say it is in crisis. Right, right. Now, she, she got to a point where she didn't recognize you. Yes. So in Alzheimer's, there comes a time where there's a diminished recognition as memory simply goes and delirium sets in at some point. Um, but um, she also had a syndrome called Capgras syndrome, which is not present in all Alzheimer's patients, but in some and in a number of neurodegenerative diseases. And in this syndrome, you believe, you come to believe that the people around you are imposters, yeah. that they're not the real person. Yeah. And I found that very troubling, extremely troubling, because after all, my wife would say, get out, get out, yeah. who are you? Yes. And fortunately, it only happened a few times. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you took care of her, um, and you know, very lovingly and all, but your book goes on uh, sort of becomes an autobiography at the beginning. Yeah. You talk about you talk about going your upbringing, going right. to medical school, and so right, on. Right, right. So and, yeah, go ahead. No, no. Uh, uh, thank you for raising that. I made it autobiographical in order to s to go deeply into our context, so that by the time we got to the sickness and what happens, people would know who we were. Right. Um, so I came from a very unpromising background. As a caregiver, I was a. <laughs> oh, as a caregiver. Yeah, yeah, I was a reckless, careless child growing up in a well to do family in Brooklyn in the 1940s and 50s. I got into all kinds of problems with the, uh, with the school, with the police, et cetera. One time a mafia recruiter mussed my hair and said, You're doing well, kid, we got our eyes on you. <laughs> and so I was not, I did not have the, the right understanding of yeah. how to care for myself care for those around me yeah. and the like. And it was my marriage to Joan that changed all of that. So right. I, 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 I was from New York. I went to Stanford as an undergraduate and I went to Stanford Medical School. And in medical school, I met this uh, incredible woman who had just returned from being in Europe for a number of years and was just saving up enough money to go back. Yeah. She was an Audrey Hepburn look-alike, uh -huh. very beautiful. She was much more sophisticated than me very different than me. I was sort of a scrappy New York kid. She was a calm, collected, natural Californian with a big European tinge to her. Mm -hmm. And um, But somehow we were able to uh, hit it off and got married. And then she shaped my life so yes. fundamentally that when she died after almost 46 years of marriage, uh, when she died and I was looking in the mirror I was astonished to see my own face because so, so much had I internalized her face in, as my part of my identity yeah. that it surprised me seeing, seeing myself. Yeah, but it, you got to a point where in medical school you had to kind of decide what you were going to do, right? Yeah. And um, you like to hear other people tell their stories. Yes. And, 
So, yeah. so that's the other side of care, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So it all started, I think, when I was a first-year medical student or a second year, I can't exactly remember now, and I was uh, on a uh, uh, rehabilitation medicine ward where a seven-year-old girl with very serious burns, very serious burns, uh, was being debrided. That is, they were taking the dead tissue off yeah. in a whirlpool bath. Yeah. which began by being a little pink and then became bloody as more of the tissue came off. And she would yell and scream. And as the uh, low person on the totem pole, I was just holding her hand to comfort her, but I wasn't giving her any comfort at all while the nurse and the surgeon uh, took off, debrided her wounds. Yeah. And uh, after a couple of days of this where I felt uh, really hopeless and actually... Uh, profoundly challenged because I, I don't think I could go keep doing this every day. It was so painful to her and hurtful to me. Yeah. I just said to her, how do you, how do you stand this? How, how do you get through it? And out of that, she stopped and just told me. And I realized that she had now understood I wanted to know what that experience was. And she let me into that experience. And she became, I wouldn't say that the pain went away for her, but it was much easier for her to tolerate the debridement. It was much easier for me to work with her. And I learned a great lesson. The lesson was that you can, even the sickest of person, whether it's a, a terminal uh, cancer, or whether it's a psychotic illness, or whether it's the pain of a, of a, of a, of a terrible fracture, you can, you can talk to them and... Uh, listen, and in listening, you get the story that tells you uh, what do they fear and what do they want, and how can you help? Yeah. And so I, I developed that idea as, as illness narratives. I developed a method called the explanatory model method to teach medical students. And there was a period of time where many medical school student, uh, schools used the, my book, the illness narratives, to train to train doctors. But I discovered that over time, uh, what I had hoped would be a conversation opener for a great conversation between a clinician and a patient actually became a conversation stopper. Uh -huh. Because as soon as they got uh -huh. the patient's idea of the, uh, what they wanted, they put it in the chart and they fixed it there like the blood pressure and the, yeah. and the hemoglobin levels. And that's not what I meant at all. I wanted to build a relationship. And that's what I've learned in the course of my career, that um, the relationship is critical to caregiving. And where you have a promising relationship, as we did in our marriage, that's very helpful for caregiving. But where you have a troubled relationship, it makes it more, more difficult. Yeah. Nonetheless, in the course of caregiving for one of the you know, most profound and, and simply said most terrible of illnesses, Alzheimer's, um, uh, trouble enters into that relationship. Yeah. So this is uh, New England Authors. If you're just joining us, uh, we're talking with Dr. Arthur Kleinman, and he's got this, uh, this wonderful book called The Soul of Care, which is a very personal book, and um, we're talking about his, his experience. And um, so you're uh, critical of medical schools. You went to medical schools. So you're critical saying that um, they have advanced technical skills but pay little attention to the patient. Can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, medical school is training the practitioner, and we have a bunch of studies now that show that while medical schools are successful in imparting technological knowledge so that graduating medical students are much better than beginning medical students in terms of the science and technology of medicine, as you would expect and hope, the reverse happens when it comes to empathy and uh, the ability to interact and, and be human with a patient. Mm. That over the course of medical school, this part of the training becomes disabling. Yeah. And there's no reason why that should be, but the consequence of that is that um, it's not encouraging for the human quality of relationships. That we have no measures of quality care. We don't measure quality care. Yes, he's we that clear, we yeah. measure institutional efficiency. Mm -hmm. How does the hospital run? How does the clinic run? Are they getting the throughput on patients and, yeah. and the like? Do we measure the relationships, the quality of listening, 
the quality of explaining whether the doctor and nurse give enough information for you to return home and know what to do, et cetera. Do they respond to questions? How is the quality of their engagement with you in the physical exam, in giving the prognosis, in talking about laboratory tests, et cetera? We don't measure any of that. And that is what the, that's what, what, what caregiving is about. So yeah. basically, we have a healthcare system in which we don't measure caregiving and also we don't privilege it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a system in which we privilege the economics, the cost, yeah. and we should be obviously concerned with cost. And we privilege the efficiency and we should be concerned with efficiency, but we don't privilege the care. And I think that's a fundamental problem and that's what my experience of a lifetime giving care as yeah. a clinician and studying care as a researcher but principally in taking care of my late wife, that's what I learned, how uh, alone families and patients are because physicians no longer engage with them in the kind of human way that carries them through the illness experience with the sense that there's someone there they can count on and who's yeah. there, is there to help. Before we move on, I just um, wanted to ask you, uh, we've had a lot of research on, on Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah. Has there been any, any progress? No, it's uh, a sad thing to tell your audience, but the fact of the, and, and this is the God's honest truth as I understand it, I'm not a research expert on Alzheimer's, but I am a personal expert on reading the literature and the like yeah. and taking care of someone with it. We have no idea really what the cause of Alzheimer's is. And we have a few medications that are claimed to slow down the cognitive decline. But it, my reading of the literature and my uh, own experience is these medications do very little. Yeah. So we, ha we don't know the cause, we don't have the treatments, and uh, it, we probably are dealing with a bunch of illnesses, not just one, uh -huh. that take different courses that are distinctive in some ways. And again, um, uh, patients are simply not informed in a way that allows them to realize how little we know on the side that would help us cure Alzheimer's right. and how important it is in the care and management of Alzheimer's that we deal with the psychological and social side of things. Right. And in my experience uh, of being the family caregiver for my wife, there was very little attention to this. Yet that's really what Alzheimer's is about. It's about the care that's provided by the family by the person themselves, by hopefully by the medical system, the nursing home, assisted living, whatever it is. Yes. And we spend very, very little time on that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the course of the, my wife's experience, I visited more with my adult kids who were incredibly helpful. I visited more than two dozen uh, cognitive care units and nursing homes and assisted living facilities in the uh, area of Cambridge. I'm your basic Cantabrigian. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah. and I, we were astonished to see how poor, poorly organized, depressingly uh, uh, set up, um, inhuman, more than half of them were. Yes. Now there were some very impressive examples and mm. of, of, of really good care. And we did get my wife at, for the last nine months of her life into one of these really fine cognitive care units. But again, um, this is an, a, a, going to be an issue for every family that takes care of a patient with Alzheimer's. Yeah. They have to come to terms with these things. And, and as what I discovered is no one prepared me for this. So no one prepared me for um, the importance of a home health aid if, you're, if you have the resources to be able to afford one or for respite care from some, some other uh, source from family members, friends, et cetera. This is critical to being able to keep going, enduring, right. enduring the care. So we have this kind of, in my view, silly notion in the United States that somehow we're resilient enough to be able to do all these things mm -hmm. and we'll get through, but no one is resilient enough to do the hard work of caring, the literally doing of the care 
It's a matter of enduring it and enduring something that's, that's difficult, that's frustrating, but I believe is ultimately m tremendously meaningful if you have the supports to keep going with it. Yeah, this, this personal care. Yes. Now, could I go back um, a little bit into your history? Yeah. Um, how did you end up in China? You spent many years uh, there. Yeah. You speak Chinese. Well, the, uh, you know, there are, two, there are two stories. There's an official account and there's the Okay. In, the unofficial. Which well, one do like you want? I'd like to hear the, uh, the unofficial The one. unofficial. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the unofficial one is that I met this beautiful woman in medical school who would become my wife, but she had other suitors besides me. Uh -huh. And learning Chinese gave me a leg up in the, conversa in the competition because she was a, a, a making herself into a, a China scholar. Uh -huh. And so that was the unofficial and, uh, and, and I, more I, truthful oh, I see. reason. And then uh, you went, first of all, to Taiwan yes. because China wasn't open. That's right. We yeah. went to Taiwan in 1969 at a time when we had no relations, uh, um, formal relations between the United States and the People's Republic of right. China. And we were in Taiwan for uh, off and on for a number of years until in 1978 we uh, transferred our research to mainland China. Yeah. So uh, you're listening to uh, New England authors here. We have the good pleasure of having Dr. Arthur Kleinman with us today. So um, t uh, tell us, uh, you, you're a uh, social anthro uh, excuse me, a medical anthropologist. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know. I, I didn't know what a medical, medical anthropologist, anthropologist was is. until I met my wife. So uh, <laughs> yeah. can, you can you tell us what a... Sure. So a medical anthropologist is a social and cultural anthropologist yeah. who instead of, let's say, studying religion or studying uh, the economy or studying um, uh, practices around food preparation and the like, studies illness and care. And a medical anthropologist is interested in the experience of illness that people have in different cultural settings, right. how the local worlds they live in make them more vulnerable or more resistant to illnesses how those disorders begin, how they develop over time, and how the um, structure of a community, the beliefs and practices, the role of stigma, the role of um, help seeking for medical practice, how that differs in distinctive settings. Mm. So in Chinese setting, for example, you have not just Western medicine, biomedicine, yeah. but you have traditional Chinese medicine, right. which has an impact on the way people think and the way people act. But also you have rather different ways of m thinking about disease and about uh, uh, and what you desire in the treatment process. And so that's what I studied is so uh, more in, in or less. So in mental illness, um, uh, culture p plays a role, yeah, right? Yeah, plays a big yeah. role. And for example, anxiety, and mental illness among Asian patients is more likely to have a physical dimension you mentioned in your book. Could you talk about that? Yes, I spent, I've spent much of my career studying this. So for the older generation of Chinese, and uh, for the old generation of Chinese, it was considered um, inappropriate, impolite, an example of sort of washing dirty linen in public by talking about uh, things like uh, not feeling well inside, being depressed, being anxious. But instead, the physical symptoms associated with depression and anxiety, because see, these are, these are biosocial problems that have a, a biology, but also a psychology. Yes. The sleep disturbance, you can't sleep too well, the loss of appetite, the loss of energy, that's what you talked about. Mm -hmm. So I studied the symptoms that people talked about, which were physical symptoms, while at the same time they either didn't experience, or most of the time they did experience, but would not express because they felt it was inappropriate, the psychological right. symptoms like depression, sadness, hopelessness, etc. Yeah, I understand. Can, um, can I ask you something else that was in your book? Uh, um, there was a lot of injustice that you you saw in China. Um, well, uh, I went to China first, as I said, 1978. 
That was two years after the end of the Cultural Revolution. And so um, I did the first study of the survivors of the Chinese Cultural Revolution and, um, and much of what they experienced and talked about was uh, injustice, their sense of injustice. And uh, when I even follow up with certain of them today, they still are looking for justice for the experiences that they've had, yeah. which was um, politically organized trauma that came from beatings, uh, criticisms of bullying, all kinds of things that were encouraged in the Cultural Revolution for youngsters to do to their teachers and their elders mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a chaotic uh, revolutionary setting. And there are many uh, surprising things that came out of this. So you had, you had students who attack teachers, physically um, uh, hurting them, blinding yeah. some of them, mm -hmm. for example. But then later, after the Cultural Revolution, going and apologizing and participating in the care of that person. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Kleinman. Sure. It was such a pleasure to have you here uh, and talk about your work. This is uh, New England Authors. We uh, record here in Cambridge, Massachusetts and broadcast stations throughout the, the uh, region. So remember, watch locally. Mm -hmm.